Welcome to everyone. I'm, I'm very happy um, about everyone who has joined us. A warm welcome to um, yeah, our audience in China, in Vietnam, in Australia, in Europe and from, for, from everywhere else where people might be uh, joining us at the moment. I am very pleased to welcome our distinguished uh, speakers. For today, a very warm welcome to Professor Shumei from the Shanghai International Studies University. Um, a warm welcome to Professor Tui Zhuang from the Ho Chi Minh University of Law. And a very warm welcome to Kate Lapin from Public Services International. Um, as Florian already mentioned, my name is Nadja, Nadja Dorschner. I work in the Asia unit um, of Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung in Berlin. And I would just like to give you a few um, yeah, introductory remarks on uh, Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung as an organization. So Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung is one of six political foundations in, in Germany. It was founded in 1990 and it is affiliated to the party Die Linke, which means in English, the left um, in Germany. Um, the, the main aims of our organization are to provide political education, to provide uh, discussion forums for critical thinking and for political alternatives. And we also aim to provide research facilities um, for progressive social analysis and for critical analysis of uh, current capitalism. Um, we all speak to you, like Florian and, and me and other people who have um, joined in the organization of this webinar as members of the Center for International Dialogue and Cooperation, which is um, the biggest department of Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung. And it is the department which contains a network of 25 offices around the world. And these offices uh, operate in more than 80 countries. And today, yes, this is um, a cooperation. This webinar series is a cooperation of our offices in Brussels, Beijing, Hanoi, and the Asia Unit in Berlin. And yes, the, the international department of Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung wants to support emancipatory actors around the world. It wants to especially contribute to equal exchange and to form a global network between um, yeah, activists, emancipatory actors and people who, who want to um, discuss with us on social justice, on social ecological transformation and how to get to a world with more international solidarity. Today we are welcoming you for this webinar on the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. Um, with these um, webinars, so there's one today and there will be another one on the 8th of July and we would also be very happy to welcome you for the next session of this webinar series. Um, we are hosting these webinars because we want to provide a better understanding of what um, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement is, what its scope is, what its nature is, how it can be understood, what it means for the countries in the region, and what will be the social, economic and geopolitical implications. So today we are concentrating on the status quo of the agreement. We will learn how it is structured and what it contains and yeah, what the expected um, implications are, especially socially and economically. And in our next um, session on the 8th of July, we will focus more on the geopolitical implications. And with this said, I want only to add one last thing. Um, if you want to participate in, in this uh, webinar, you can um, ask questions. There's a Q&A box for that, so we would be um, yeah, very happy to interact with you because we all know that in these 
uh, online formats, it is a little bit sad that we don't really see each other. We don't really know who's there and what the mood is. So yeah, please use the chat and especially the Q&A box to interact with us. And yeah, I, I wish you an interesting and um, engaged exchange. And with this, I give back to Florian. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadia. So let's start with our webinar on the RCP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. Um, I uh, give you some basic information. Uh, let me see what I got here. The RCP was, the negotiations were launched in 2012 at an Asian summit, and it includes 10 Asian countries, so the Asian region, um, plus China, Japan, South Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. This means that we're dealing with an economic region that covers almost one third of the world's population and also almost one third of the global GDP, which uh, means that it's quite big, if not the, the biggest uh, uh, trade agreement around. Let's see what else we got. Um, well, interesting is that um, there's another agreement which is called the CPTPP, the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, which covers uh, a lot of countries which are also in the RCP. Um, why am I saying that? Because the CPTPP is kind of a revival of an other agreement which had been negotiated, the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which included the United States, um, who withdraw from that agreement in 2016. Um, and so we can say that there was a period where there was some kind of uh, competition on how to set trade rules in a certain world region. Um, because out of the 11 signatories of CPTPP, seven are part of RCEP. Now CPTPP only covers 6.6% uh, of the world population and about 15% of global GDP. So in terms of uh, that it is much smaller than RCEP. And um, we will go later and probably in the next seminar more into the geopolitical details of what that means. But of course, the main question is who is going to setting trade rules in the region? Now, what we learned from the CPTPP is that's a very far reaching agreement. What I tried to learn about the RCEP, from what I understand, there's very contradictory uh, opinions on the depth of its uh, of its chapters, how how far it goes in in uh, behind the border liberalization issues, so everything which is not classic trade issues. Um, there's people who are saying it's like um, it will have an enormous impact. There's others who say, oh, no, 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 this is uh, quite lightweight. It doesn't go far beyond uh, WTO provisions and so on. But I'm not the expert, so I'm only uh, raising these questions. And I hope our experts today will clarify um, all these issues, uh, some of the issues I mentioned so far. So our first expert is uh, Professor Shumei, who is, hi, welcome, Professor. Hi, um, thank you, Chair. Can I share the screen? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to introduce you for one minute, and I want to keep, okay. to keep your wonderful screen of the Golden Gate Bridge for that moment, even though I guess you're not based in San Francisco, but in Shanghai, because you are professor at the School of Economics and Finance at the Shanghai International Studies University. 
And um, we are looking forward to your presentation, which will look into what's really in the 20 chapters of the RCP, and also what does China expect from the RCP. So please, Professor, share your screen and uh, let's start. Okay, thank you, Jeff. I'll share the screen first. Um, can you see it? Yes. It okay? Yes, ah, we can see it. It's fine? Yeah, yes. Good. Okay. Um, so, um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my great pleasure. Thank you very much for your invitation. Um, so, I will uh, start with what is the uh, in our shape. And uh, uh, many talk about the most important chapters of our shape and the achievements. Uh, as well as the limitations of our ship. So uh, I think we all know that, uh, um, yes, um, uh, what do we expect from uh, our ship for the region and for China? So I'll talk mainly about that first. Generally speaking, I think uh, um, in the coming decades, the our ship is hopeful to become an important force for economic growth in this region. And in the short run, um, the RCEP uh, conduces to supporting all countries in this region to jointly uh, combat the COVID-19 pandemic and to promoting regional economic recovery through inclusive and uh, sustainable development. And in the long run, um, the RCEP will pave the way for deeper economic integration among our members in addition I think the members can use um, its provisions as a springboard to um, deeper economic reforms and improve the competitiveness of our industries. So, so as to facilitate um, all the member countries to uh, achieve mutual benefit and win-win situation. So for China, generally speaking, uh, as we all know, China has close economic ties with other RCEP member countries, and China's total trade with other RCEP uh, member countries uh, accounted for 31.2% uh, of its total foreign trade in the year 2019. So the opening up layout of this um, uh, FTA framework or network is uh, conducive to promoting China's new uh, dual uh, circulation development pattern. As we all know, uh, this pattern, uh, this new pattern is centered on the domestic economy and aims at uh, better integrating domestic economy with the global economy. So it will uh, not only benefit the Chinese economy, but also create more growth opportunities for countries across the world. And for the region, I think, um, um, the successful signing of this uh, agreement reflects the uh, characteristics and also vitality of regional economic integration in Asia. So it is a milestone in the process of uh, Asia uh, regional integration and also a new demonstration of global economic cooperation from uh, the general, uh, from the regional level. So this is the general uh, introduction. So in order for us to see uh, clearly what is actually in RCEP, as the chair just mentioned, there are some member states uh, which are overlapping. So I actually um, um, put the, um, uh, the legal text, as we all know, has 20 chapters in the RCEP. Uh, so I compared these 20 chapters with the 30 chapters in the uh, CPTPP. As you could see, for the black ones, the black words meaning uh, they're the same. For the words in blue, um, I just want to um, uh, uh, denoting the uh, the diction of the words. The choices of words are, are slightly different. For the ones which are in red, as we can see all together, there are eight chapters um, in CPTPP. First is the chapter four, textiles and apparel goods. And then uh, chapter 17, state-owned enterprises and uh, designated monopolies. And followed with chapter 19, labor, chapter 20, environment, chapter 22, uh, competitiveness and business uh, facilitation, 
Chapter 23, uh, development. Chapter 25, regulatory coherence. And then uh, last one is cha chapter 26, transparency and anti-corruption. These eight chapters are actually missing RSA. So this is one uh, difference if we compare uh, the chapters in RSA with the, those in CPTPP. And the second different uh, differences are in blue ones I uh, leveled. For example, uh, if we go one by one, as you can see, in chapter two, um, in RCEP, uh, it's named as trading goods, but in CPTPP is called national treatment and market access for goods. But uh, if we read closely, we'll find article 2.3 um, in RCEP uh, actually deals with the national treatment. Um, and then if you, uh, uh, let's just move on to chapter three, rose of origin, that's in the RCEP. And uh, in CPTPP, there is also um, the origin procedures, uh, which is not uh, there in the RCEP. And then um, there are uh, another very uh, big difference. That's the uh, chapter 18 CPTPP, that is technical barriers to trade. And uh, in RCEP, that's in chapter six, uh, which is called uh, standards technical regulations and conformity assessment procedures. And this, as we all know, we usually call them technical measures to trade. So measures may not become barriers. So there are slight differences here. And then there is another difference. Um, as you could see, we mentioned uh, there were eight chapters, which were actually, which are missing in RCEP. And there is uh, another very important difference is for uh, trade and service. In CPTPP, there are three chapters, that is chapter 10, uh, cross-board trading services, and chapter 11, financial services, and then chapter 13, telecommunications. But uh, we'll find in RCEP, there is only one chapter, that is chapter eight, uh, which is named as trading services, but there are three annexes. Uh, annex 8A, um, that's financial services, and then Annex 8C, that's uh, professional services. And then there is a, a Annex A to B, telecommunication services, which is uh, actually a, a separate chapter, chapter 13 in CPTPP. And if we continue, we can find, uh, finally, there is another difference. Um, that's chapter 27. In the uh, CPTPP, um, it's named as administrative and institutional provisions. Uh, if we compare in, uh, um, in great detail, we'll find in CPTPP, there is a particular administration of uh, dispute settlement proceedings. So when we compare the chapters in the RCEP with the CPTPP, and words, we have seen the differences in general, and here again, there are um, six, uh, four annexes in the um, RCEP. So, um, I will, after comparison of the chapters, I will try to um, um, talk about the features of the RCEP so that you will understand the achievements and also limitations of RCEP. So I think the first uh, feature would be largest, as the chair already mentioned, in terms of population, economy, and also trade. Uh, RCEP is the, uh, the biggest um, uh, free trade agreement in the world now. It has a uh, consumer market for some 2.2 billion people. And also it has um, uh, the greatest uh, development potentials as well. So that's the first feature. And the second feature would be comprehensive. And uh, as we've seen uh, uh, all together, 20 chapters and four appendices. And so it is relatively uh, comprehensive in coverage. Uh, it has the um, actually uh, many areas that the ASEAN uh, plus one FTS uh, do not cover actually. So there are specific provisions for trading goods, those traditional ones, and also there are some other ones in services and uh, some ones we could say at a rather higher level. For example, um, there is a particular uh, um, the um, uh, specification for the e-commerce. And then um, another thing I think we should mention that's the number of sectors opened by the RCEP. Um, evidence that has been increased if we compare um, to the basis of the WTO. 
And I just to give one example about China, or in China and WTO, uh, we actually opened 100 service uh, sectors. And this time, uh, China has uh, 22 new sectors, uh, including research and development, uh, management consulting services, uh, and also the ones related to manufacturing and air transport, and loosens up restrictions on foreign ownership in 37 sectors, including uh, finance, law, construction, and ocean shipping. So um, there is also a serious exploration on high standard roads. So this is the, um, the actually uh, the second feature, comprehensive. And uh, I think the third feature, as we all agree, uh, is uh, inclusive. Because we all know, um, as far as the economic system is concerned, the levels of development and also size and scale of uh, all the signatories uh, of uh, RCP uh, taking into consideration will find great differences between them. So, for example, we have uh, uh, major economies like China and Japan, and also underdeveloped ones like Cambodia and Laos. So, RCEP borrows uh, successful experiences of um, East Asia cooperation. So uh, for uh, try to, trying to uh, granting less developed uh, countries certain grants periods or exception clauses. Uh, for example, for tariff cuts, um, it provides uh, a grants period of uh, up to 20 years for some of the products to um, subject to zero tariffs. And also it uh, uh, grants special preferential treatment to developing country um, members. Uh, for example, we'll see in the chapter on economic and uh, technical corporations, um, it provides capacity building and also technical assistance. So that's the uh, third um, characteristics. And I think the, uh, um, the fourth one should be open. It is, um, um, it's open for accession by any economy 18 months after its entry into force. And also for India as a regional uh, negotiating state, um, the, um, the RCEP offers the India fast track action. That means it uh, uh, doesn't have to wait. It can rejoin on the date of entry into force of the agreement. So um, this is the, um, another uh, feature I think the fifth feature I've just mentioned the difference, okay, in terms of economic aggression we mentioned, and also in terms of per capita GDP, for example, um, uh, Australia has um, uh, uh, more than 60,000 US dollar and uh, Myanmar and Cambodia uh, only uh, have uh, just uh, more than uh, 1,000 US dollar. So owing to the huge gap, um, and also the different interests, demands, various levels of uh, acceptable opening conditions. So um, these all have been taken into consideration during uh, negotiation. I think the next uh, uh, feature would be difficult uh, because of the uh, uh, differences among the signatory countries. So the negotiation was difficult. It took about eight years, as we all know. And uh, during the negotiation, all the member states have tried our best. For example, China, we have uh, actively promoted a high level opening up to the outside world, uh, providing solid domestic assistance for uh, our set negotiations. And the last feature would be flexible. And uh, for flexibility, I think the first thing we can see is that um, in RCEP, the uh, tariff concessions exclude uh, products considered uh, sensitive, particularly in the agricultural sectors. Another flexibility uh, we can see from schedules for trading goods. For some members, they just have one tariff schedule, and that is uh, on offer for all the other members and for the others, they have some variations in their schedules. So um, this actually, um, um, because of the different levels of economic uh, development, so there is um, the flexibility also manifests in the implementation of the earlier, uh, of the certain provisions we I mentioned earlier. 
and I here I will just cite Cambodia as an example, because um, Cambodian is a uh, substantial uh, adjustment to come into compliance with the new RCEP rules. So Cambodia asked and also uh, given uh, received extension of five years to implement provisions like uh, application of digital technology at customs and the same five year extension of the time for introducing a range of new roles to manage express shipments, etc. So uh, to summarize, I think um, there are several key breakthroughs. The first breakthrough, the RCEP reforms, uh, uh, first, that's the first time forms the uh, trilateral free trade agreements between China, South Korea, and Japan. And the second breakthrough would be the harmonization of the roles of region among the signatories. Um, RCEP established a common roles of region so that uh, a single certificate of region uh, could be used uh, throughout the, uh, the whole uh, zone. And uh, also it established a flexible roles of a region. For example, for some goods, uh, if they uh, reach the uh, regional value content of uh, 40%, and that good could be considered as originating in the region. So this would allow the companies to diversify and also optimize their uh, supply chains. Uh, if you say uh, for the breakthrough, I think another breakthrough would be the e-commerce rules, uh, which actually uh, incorporate into the agreement. Uh, uh, especially uh, this is the uh, in this region, the first time uh, consensus um, the, on some of the key issues in this respect, including the cross-fold uh, information transmission and also information uh, storage, online consumer um, protection, etc. But of course, uh, at the very beginning, when we compared the chapters in the um, CPTPP with those uh, in RCEP, and we could see, um, even though these two agreements are all make uh, free trade uh, agreements, but uh, there are differences. Um, the first, uh, I think we all agree, is the degree of uh, liberalization uh, within RCEP is not as deep as in CPTPP, and the coverage is less comprehensive. And of course, it's less ambitious, as we mentioned, that it does not include a chapter on the environment, uh, labor and state-owned uh, or state-owned enterprises. So um, the, uh, another presenter will talk about investment, as we'll see provisions on investment, intellectual property, and also e-commerce are considered also less extensive or in-depth than those in the CPTPP. And uh, if, um, generally speaking, our shape is expected to uh, eliminate it approximately 90% uh, of the tariffs on goods traded uh, uh, between the member countries after more than uh, 20 years of liberalization. But uh, we, if we compare uh, that to the CPTPP, the proportion of the tariffs eliminated by the CPTPP will be approximately 98% once it is fully implemented. So finally, I would like to summarize, unlike CPTPP, RCEP recognized that uh, one size does not fit for all. So there are some chapters which are missing, and also there are some flexibilities, for example, in finding roles of region. But uh, um, maybe um, the other side of the coin uh, is the RCEP recognized that and this may preempt the future trade um, frictions, as we hope. That's all, Chair. Back to you. Thank you so much, Professor Shumei, for this very uh, comprehensive and precise analysis of the chapters included in the RCP and also to give some kind of uh, interpretation also in terms of uh, difficulties and differences between economies that are included in this uh, free trade agreement and um, on the depth of uh, trade liberalization in, in comparison to CPTPP. That was a very informative uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Um, now um, we would have some time if there are any questions of 
for clarification if something has not been understood well that would be now the time um but i see the question we received so far um more going into depth and this we will do after the three presentations so i guess we will head on for the second presentation and after the second presentation there will be also a short uh, slot if you have any questions of understanding um, please feel free to put them already into the chat or in the q a box um, now we will continue with professor tran can you yeah now i can see you wonderful um so now we got the, this general overview and also the perspective of China on the RCP. Um, we are uh, very eager to learn about um, another perspective on the same agreement from another member state, which is Vietnam. Professor Tran is uh, based in Ho Chi Minh City, where she is uh, working on the Ho Chi Minh City University of Law. And she's also specialized in trade law. Um, so there's a, a Jamaican singer who said uh, in Babylon, we move two, one step forward and two step backwards. In RCP, does Vietnam move one step forward and two step backwards or one step backwards, but two step forwards? Give us a bit of uh, interpretation of what's in RCP for Vietnam. You need to turn on your microphone. We cannot hear you yet, Professor Tran. There seems to be some problems with the mic. You're still muted. Yes, now Hello. it's working. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, you can hear me now. Wonderful. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Horn, for your wonderful presentation, introduction, and um, greeting to all from Ho Chi Minh City. It is uh, three thirty-six p.m. now. The weather is good, uh, but uh, because of COVID nineteen, we are in the mode of social distancing. So I'm very excited to meet with you via this webinar. And I would like to thank you to ILS teams from Germany, from Luxembourg, and from Southeast Asia. I see that uh, Philip Degenhardt is there. Uh, happy to see you. Uh, who organize and facilitate this international scientific exchange. Um, so uh, I will share my screen with you. okay yes it's fine yeah so uh the organizer of the, the this program uh, asked me to reply to the question of what is in the rcep under perspective of a vietnamese lawyer so in order to answer to this question uh i will uh present uh, at first uh, some general perspective on RCEP trade and non-trade provisions, in particular those related to labor rights and environment protections. And after that, I will mention very briefly some implications of this agreement for Vietnam, uh, which is a developing countries uh, of which the economy is much smaller than that of China, but uh, which is a member of the two new general free trade agreements, which are CPTPP and EVFTA. So EVFTA is the, the um, uh, European Union Vietnam Free Trade Agreement. Um, so uh, in order to answer to, uh, to, to this question, we'll begin with trade liberalization first. Um, um, we have learned from Professor Chen that you know, RCEP is a very comprehensive and huge agreement, which covers 
a lot of fields. Uh, I will not repeat her analysis, which are already very comprehensive, but I just want to highlight one point is that we all know that on the one hand, Australia, China, Japan, New Zealand, and South Korea are already members of the economic agreements with ASEAN uh, under the form of ASEAN plus one FTA. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, all the RCEP members are already WTO members. So why RCEP should be established? Uh, one of the reasons is that the RCEP is not a simple repetition of WTO commitments or ASEAN plus one FTA commitments. Uh, the reports from Asian Secretariat and the Vietnam Ministry of Industry and Trade demonstrate that there are many RCEP provisions uh, that go further than those of the WTO or uh, Asian plus one FTA. And the typical provisions of this kind can be found in chapter four, chapter eight, chapter 10, chapter 11, chapter 16 of the RCEP. So uh, it is reasonable to conclude that the RCEP represents a step forward in regional trade liberalization. Uh, now we'll move to the uh, RCEP uh, non-trade provisions, in particular labor rights and environmental protection provisions. Uh, we all know that the trade and investment liberalizations uh, imply not only positive but also negative social and environmental impacts. Therefore, the new generation free trade agreements often contain provisions which prevent the race to the bottom between parties of FTAs in order to protect labor rights and environment. Uh, it is stated that because of its size and its coverage, the RCEP will impact a greater number of people than any previously signed FTAs. So it is interesting to make an inventory of most important RCEP provisions to see how trade liberalization, labor rights protection, and environmental preservation uh, are harmonized in, this, uh, in the framework of this agreement. So to, in order to obtain this goal, I will first of the RCEPs and secondly, I will examine some specific provisions related to labor rights and environmental process, uh, protection. Um, the, the general principles and objectives of an agreement uh, give indication of its members' will, intentions. Uh, that is why it is they, they are very important because they provide context to interpret parties, rights, and obligations, which are prescribed in specific provisions of an agreement. In the case of the RCEP, uh, the general principles of, and objectives can be found in guiding principles and objectives for negotiating the RCEP in the preamble of the agreement, in chapter one related to initial provisions and chapter 20 on final provisions. Um, so, for those who are pro-environmental and labor rights protections, um, the, the reading of uh, these provisions uh, may make them feel very discouraged. Why? Because uh, the reference to sustainable development can be found only once in the preamble. Uh, it mentions the interdependence between three pillars of sustainable development. However, uh, ultimately, it is to highlight the role of economic partnerships. When reading the guiding principles and objectives for negotiating, we can easily uh, see that the social and environment issues do not interest the negotiator of the agreement. Uh, the objectives of negotiators, as you see, are purely economic. And the principles of negotiating focus on trade and investment liberalism. Uh, similarly, neither chapter one nor chapter 20 contains any provision related to social and environmental concerns. So um, uh, we can conclude that uh, from the beginning, the negotiator of the RCEP do not pay much attention to social and environmental issues. Um, 
the specific provisions addressing social and environmental, environmental concerns can be found in different chapters of the RCEP, but uh, we focus mostly on chapter 10 on investment. Why? Because it is often alleged that investment uh, often risk to uh, uh, imply the abuse of human rights and environment. So it is interesting to see how the RCEP negotiators attempt to limit this risk. Uh, we will also analyze chapter 17, uh, general provisions and exceptions, because the exceptions may offer to governments freedom to take care of social and environmental interests in the context of trade and investment liberalization. So uh, chapter 10, investment. Uh, contains at least five elements, which gives opportunities to governments to establish and implement human rights and environmental protection measures. Uh, firstly, uh, this chapter shall not apply to governmental procurements, subsidies or grants provided by a party, services applied in the exercise of governmental authority. Uh, so uh, the, this limited scope of uh, the chapter will give the governments more freedom to procure goods and services, to subsidize companies, to supply services in fields necessary for social and environmental interest. Secondly, the uh, most favored nation treatment clause does not encompass any international dispute resolution procedures or mechanism under other existing or future international agreements. So uh, this clause will prevent the investors from bringing cases against government members of the RCEP while using ISDS mechanism in other IIA of which they are members. Uh, in this regard, we can note as uh, Mr. Horn has just um, Mason, uh, this chapter 10 hasn't imposed yet an ISDS mechanism. And this mechanism will be considered during the discussions organized no later than two years after entry into force of the agreement. So this will give the opportunities for the public to put pressures and for governments to calculate the pros and cons of integrating an ISDS mechanism in this agreement. Thirdly, um, uh, this chapter provides for the exceptions to the rules on prohibition of performance requirement. So it will give the, uh, basically the government the freedom to apply measures to require investment in certain fields, to promote training and employment workers, to promote research and development, to facilitate protection of public health. Uh, fourthly, uh, this chapter gives uh, the whole stage the opportunities to influence the composition of foreign invested companies, boards of directors. And uh, fifthly, um, it provides for exceptions to rules on expropriation. So it enables governments to apply measures to protect public interest, in particular, to protect the public health. To sum up, chapter 10 gives governments some freedom to elaborate and uh, apply measures to protect public interest. Uh, and the most remarkable point for me is the absence of the, the ISDS mechanism. And this freedom of governments is reinforced by Article 17.11, which excludes the applications of dispute settlement mechanisms to governments' approval or admission of foreign investment proposals. This will enable governments' refusals of foreign investment proposals, which are in conflict with social or environmental interests. So it looks very encouraging, but uh, you know, when we do some more researches, we see that the, this freedom is not new in comparison with uh, what is provided in CPTPP or in EVFTA, of which Vietnam is a member. Uh, Besides, uh, it is necessary to note that nothing in, in uh, this chapter mentions directly uh, the protection of labor rights or environment. Uh, why in the CPTPP and EBFTA, we all know that they, are, they have entire chapters on labor, 
on environment or on trade and sustainable development. Chapter 17 contains some clauses related to environmental and human rights protection too. However, in general, uh, we can state that they are similar to or less ambitious than those in the CPTPP or the EVFTA. So, uh, in brief, the RCEP is a newer FTA than the CPTPP and the EVFTA. However, its approach to labor rights and environmental protection issues is much more traditional than CPTPP and EVFTA. And that is the reason why it is criticized for ignoring environmental and labor rights protections. And from this perspective, uh, it represents a step backward in comparison with CPTPP and EVFTA. So now I will move briefly to uh, the implications for Vietnam. Uh, as uh, Mr. Horn um, uh, mentioned, the, uh, uh, CP, uh, the RCEP is a huge agreement which uh, covers one third of the world population and one third of the global GDP. So for Vietnam, the RCEP will facilitate the access to this huge market and help it to involve more deeply in regional value chain. Um, what I would like to highlight here is the RCEP cumulative rules of origin. Uh, what does cumulative rules of origin mean? It means that as long as the RCEP member processes materials originating from other RCEP countries, materials can be regarded as originating from processing country. So consequently, the goods which before would not have been considered as originating goods, we have more chance to be regarded as originating goods after RCEP in try into force. So they can enjoy preferential tariffs more easily. This will mean a lot for Vietnam, uh, who imports a lot of raw materials from China and other RCEP countries. But it is also very good for China, who will export more raw materials. Uh, from my perspective, the participation to the RCEP will not create a lot of legal burdens for Vietnam, because in majority of cases, Vietnam's trade liberalization commitment in RCEP are not higher than those in Asian Plus FTA. Besides, the labor rights and environmental protection commitment in RCEP are much lower than those in CPTPP and EVFTA. We can recall that um, you know, while participating in CPTPP and EVFTA, Vietnam had to amend its labor code and its environmental protection law. Uh, this is not the case when it participates to RCEP. So it is reasonable to assume that in the short term, Vietnam will benefit from the market access to RCEP members at a low legal cost. However, from the economic point of view, uh, I think that it will entail some costs for Vietnam. Following amendments of labor and environmental protection laws, um, thanks to the participation to CPTPP and EVFTA, Vietnam's enterprises will be bound by more rigorous labor rights and environmental standards, but uh, it will, they will have to face the competitions from RCEP members' companies, which are not bound by the similar standards. And besides, the branches of production of Vietnam will have to face more competitions from RCEP members who also benefit from cumulative, cumulative rules of origin. Uh, Vietnam will also need to select good foreign investment projects while harmonizing investment promotions and public interest protection. And this is another challenge for Vietnam while participating to the RCEP. So that is the end of my uh, presentation. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much for your presentation, Professor Tran. I think we all understood very well. There was some kind of background noise, but uh, generally it went all well. I think if there would have been a problem, someone would have mentioned it in the chat. So there's no questions of understanding. 
Um, thank you so much for for elaborating uh, even more on some crucial chapters uh, of the RCEP. Um, especially you mentioned, or the, the absence probably of some crucial chapters with, where you mentioned the environmental provisions and labor rights, which you labeled a step backward, um, but also the absence of uh, investor to state dispute settlement uh, uh, provisions, which you labeled a step forward, but with the opportunity or with the danger to move two steps backward again, because uh, then there's still a door open to include this. Um, and you mentioned um, the, 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 the dangers from the Vietnam perspective on, on public interest because of competition with uh, other countries from the region uh, um, and, and the, the difference of standards. Um, and you also mentioned uh, trade and services, which has been already mentioned by Professor Shumei, which is an, uh, obviously an important uh, part of the agreement. And now we want to look more also, especially into this uh, service chapter. Therefore, we have uh, from Public Services International, the Confederation of Service Trade Unions, um, Kate Lapin, who is uh, PSI's Regional Secretary for Asia and the Pacific region. Welcome, Kate. Thank you, and uh, thanks to all at Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung for inviting me. Um, this is a campaign that PSI has been uh, part of in the region with our affiliates for a number of years. And we've worked with all the other global union federations in the Asia Pacific region. Um, and so our starting point, I should say, is a bit different than the first two presentations, which is that we have been campaigning against this trade agreement and other trade agreements. And we don't see um, trade agreements in general as progress for workers. But uh, for PSI's perspective, we also have deep concerns about the impact on access to public services and the increasing role that trade agreements um, provide to large corporations. So the uh, growth in corporate power and the growth in inequality that um, trade agreements um, support. I will share my screen and try and provide a bit of a um, presentation, but I'm going to skip over in the interests of time some of this because you know, I'm sure we'd all like to have some discussions, um, give people an opportunity to ask questions. And because the other speakers have already explained a bit of the content, um, I am going to provide a little bit more of um, a critique on what I think are the problems. And uh, I acknowledge some of what's been said around that the RCEP is a, um, has more flexibility than the, the CPTPP in terms of um, developing countries. It acknowledges the differences between the, the economies, the, the state of different economies, and that's a good thing. Um, and it has, I guess, uh, less deep liberalization than the CPTPP, which is also a good thing. But um, in general, I we can't say that the RCEP represents progress. In fact, it represents a deepening of neoliberalism, particularly in the countries that didn't have uh, significant trade agreements of that nature in the past. Um, I just thought I, the first thing here, the first key point is answering the question that you asked earlier, um, which was who sets the rules. And that's something that uh, has always been suggested that the RCEP was about China and ASEAN setting rules and that the CPTPP was about the US and its allies setting rules. Uh, and it may be that they both had interests in um, opening up other markets, but the truth is that it's capital that sets, is setting these rules. I don't think it's in the interests of countries. Obviously, we know that the US withdrew, but we shouldn't we shouldn't be misled by this idea that these are competing rules 
these are pretty much the same rules <laughs> with slight differences that have been, some of which have been outlined before with the other speakers, but they are the same rules. It's not, uh, it's capital who sets these rules. In fact, it, these rules have all been drafted by um, big, big corporations, representatives, law firms that represent them or chambers of commerce. So it's not about um, particular sovereign rules, it's, it's about capital and the extent to which capital can influence countries. Um, so obviously we are deeply worried about, there's been some discussion about labor, the representation of labor chapters, but I don't think that's uh, the extent to, we, we know that in the past labor chapters have not been able to protect workers and that there are a whole range of ways that uh, workers and communities suffer. Um, and I'll go through a little bit more some of those, but I wanted to also stress that this has been negotiated secretly. Um, this is anti-democratic. Of course, people should have a say in what uh, these major decisions about how the economy um, operates, but instead they are all secret. We only ever know what's going on if we get leaks um, and we have to sometimes make um, assumptions about what's in there until they've signed, until they're signed. And I mean, that's, that's ridiculous that our governments are making decisions without consulting with us. Um, and that we should know whether they're in the interests of people by the response of corporations um, and that have, who have welcomed the RCEP and the TPP. Although the corporations have said themselves, they would like the RCEP to go further. I just wanted to make the point, and this is research we are currently undertaking and will have available later, is that we most countries have had to breach these rules as a result of COVID. Most countries um, have, have had to take action either by stopping exports they needed, um, obviously from closing down borders, um, by, by in some cases taking over private uh, private enterprise to be able to produce public services. There's a whole range of ways during COVID that actually trade rules have been a hindrance to the capacity of governments to act when there's a major risk, a major health risk, but of course that could apply to other major uh, risks. Um, now I'm gonna flick through these because they have been spoken about. I just wanted to share this, which is some research that um, UNCPAD, the UN Mission on Trade and Development, the, the UN body that's responsible for really looking at the development issues of developing countries um, did in looking at the economic impacts because we always are told that these trade agreements are gonna increase, um, largely increase economic activity and therefore increase jobs. But this is not the case and we know, and the work, research they have done has shown that the largest increases are in those developed economies um, or in China. And so here you see that the blue is the ASEAN countries and the orange is the non-ASEAN countries and uh, that the balance of trade in ASEAN countries goes backwards and that um, the change in exports is minimal. There is an increasing change in exports, but it is, not out, it is largely outweighed by the change in imports. And so their balance of trade will go down in those, um, most of the ASEAN countries. Of course, some of the developed economies like Singapore and Malaysia might uh, fare better. And that's part of this next slide. And I'm not going to go into detail. I can share it if you like, but this shows who wins and who loses. And even though um, obviously some of this may not happen immediately because as was discussed, there's a graduated process for economies that might be um, developing economies might happen over five, six years, but eventually they do have to reduce all their tariffs um, on the designated areas and um, will be flooded in most cases with um, imports. But we also should consider what this means for other countries. So for example, if there's a gain in Vietnam, there's a likely loss in Bangladesh because one large part of their economy is um, textiles. And so a projected growth in the textile industry in Vietnam, for example, or Cambodia is um, not because there's a growth in people wanting to buy uh, 
textiles, but because it will be a shift in where that takes place because there will be lower costs for multinationals and those lower costs might be tariffs. But the obvious other way to attract lower, uh, to have lower costs is to drive down wages and conditions. Um, now, I, as you said, the Thirst Services chapter is an important one for us. And this is one of the reasons that we are really concerned about all trade agreements is the way that they're designed to open up our public services to foreign investors and to secure privatisation and not allow governments to um, take action to return privatised public services to the public when they fail. And we know that's happening in the region, for example, in Indonesia, um, there's been a, a court decision that the privatised water is a human rights violation and should return to the public. But there's you know, foreign investors there who are th will threaten to um, take action on, because of you know, trade protection. And so there's a whole, uh, there is um, this provision in the RCEP and it's strange, it's, it has actually a, a two pronged approach, which is called a negative list and a positive list, which is a slightly unusual for a trade agreement. Normally you would have one or the other, but in this particular trade agreement, uh, the countries couldn't agree. And what this means is that some countries list which industries are open to foreign investors and where governments will no longer have the capacity to preserve those industries for, for um, local investors or for public, you know, only for um, publicly, uh, public services, and that they, the public funding will only be restricted uh, to national. But all, and this is the um, positive list when you can say, we will open up this industry or that industry, we will we'll liberalise this industry or that industry where foreign investors can be treated as if they're a national investor. Or there's a negative list which says, these are the ones that um, we reserve. But everything else, everything else, even things you haven't thought of yet, things that might come in in the future can, are, are open. And that negative list really is effectively opens up everything because things can be um, categorised in many different ways. And so you'll see the countries in the negative list are mostly the countries that have already opened up through the TPP, the CPTPP, apart from Indonesia. And that's a deep concern that Indonesia has decided to put itself there on the negative list. And the others um, in the RCEP are on the positive list. That means they've had to say which, which industries and each one is different and that can be a good thing so that not every country opens up the same. Some can you know, really restrict their number. Um, but again, there'll be pressure. To, there is pressure within the, the agreement to revisit this and open it both to further industries and also uh, to reconsider the negative list approach. The only country there, uh, surprising to see um, both, well, actually there's two countries there that are part of the CPTPP, and that is Vietnam and New Zealand. So they have not, uh, you know, it would have been good if they could get the negative list in the CPTPP. So this, this is really important because of course, um, a lot of what we've seen in other countries is that a large amount of, of cases that are brought to, to ISDS relate to the services chapter and that the corporations are trying around the world to expand um, these rules. They had tried through the Trading Services Agreement and that's now being revisited at the World Trade Organization. A number of countries are trying to get those rules in there. And lo lots of civil societies, workers, uh, people that depend on public services around the world have already fought those off once. And now they keep coming back through trade agreements, bilaterals, and now at the World Trade Organization. Um, just quickly moving on, I had mentioned that I've written in the past about the impact of these trade agreements on women's human rights. And it is the people uh, in, in communities that most depend on public services that really um, suffer because as we know, privatization is, uh, has impacted mostly on people who can't afford to pay for services. And privatization leads also to a reduction in the uh, quality of services and even at the UN um, Special Rapporteur on Poverty has found that privatisation is uh, systemic, uh, systemically eliminates human rights. Um, and as it does that, it increases the burden of care on women. And that's also um, been well documented that privatisation then means 
um, that that communities, families have to rely on women where they should be relying on public services. Um, and that's obviously very critical for public health. We've seen during this public this emergency that in the region, the countries who've privatised their health have um, done significantly worse than those who have been able to have a, a decent public health system. There's other elements uh, that I've written about before that are relate to gender. One is about the e-commerce provisions and the way that um, they protect corporations from having their algorithms, for example, at least scrutin scrutinised. Um, that, but also in this case, that governments um, had been discussing, and there is reference to um, to procurement policies. Um, and what was interesting here is that. Um, India did cite this as one of the reasons that they were thinking of not joining and ultimately they did leave the RCEP and I've got that quote there um, on the screen, which is a, that the government acknowledged that they did not want to surrender the right to help support, for example, women in um, their procurement policy. They, would, they wanted to retain the right to be able to procure from communities they wanted to support. And I think that's a really important policy. I know that in Vietnam and other countries, there's also pro-women procurement and um, that can be surrendered through these agreements. Um, I, I, I think it's already been mentioned that, this, that the RCEP does not currently have an investor state dispute settlement procedure. It has a state to state um, dispute settlement procedure, which is more like the WTO. But what we should remember is that states can sometimes act as corporations when corporations have increasing influence, and this is what trade agreements do. The trade agreements give the right to corporations to be consulted in the development of policy. Um, this is under transparency provisions, which is ironic. You know, we think transparency is actually about protecting democracy, but in this case, it's about protecting the right of corporates to influence policy. Um, and take, for example, that in Australia, Australia was sued by Philip Morris uh, using trade agreements through an ISDS case for its cigarette labelling. When that was unsuccessful in its ISDS, um, Indonesia used a state-to-state -state dispute settlement on behalf of those companies to, for the same, to take the same action. So you can often find that states are willing to take action uh, for, the, you know, for those corporations whether they be large donors or just key influencers in the country, particularly when they're a large part of the industry as tobacco is a large part of Indonesia's um, industries. So at the moment, as was suggested earlier, this will be reviewed and that remains a risk and a risk that um, we will be highlighting with our members to make sure doesn't get introduced into the RCEP is the introduction of investor state dispute settlements. Um, and lastly, just so that we do have some time to discuss this a little more, I just wanted to make the point that, um, th as others have said, this, is, this agreement was a long time in the negotiations. It was worse um, from what we know, of course, as I said, it was secretive. But from the draft, from the leaked documents, there were a lot of uh, chapters that were very exactly the same as the chapters in TPP um, or drafted for other agreements, and that's what constantly happens. The same language gets recirculated time and again. But it was through the mobilisation of uh, social movements in the region that it was being able to be improved to some extent and, importantly, for India to withdraw. And um, here we have um, a group in the region called Unions for Trade Justice, and we work together on trade related issues, um, which includes at the moment things like having the World Trade Organization provide a waiver for um, in the to allow for vaccines and other and other medicines not to be have an intellectual property uh, provisions applied so that we can have generics. But those are the kind of things I think we all need to be involved with to really protect both the public policy space, workers and communities from these extremely dangerous trade agreements. And I'll leave it there and happy to ask, uh, to answer any questions um, that the audience might have. 
Thank you so much, Kate, uh, for this wonderful presentation, um, which also added a lot uh, from another perspective, the perspective of the workers. Um, so there's still about 15 to 20 minutes now for question and answers. And um, yeah, I will, however, uh, uh, summarize in two sentences what, what Kate said, I try. <laughs> um, <laughs> basically, she said uh, the rules are set by capital. But then she also said that states can operate as corporations. Um, and that, of course, labor chapters have not been able to, to protect workers, but it's organized work who is protecting workers, like always. Um, she said uh, UNCTED study showed that there's, uh, there's uh, gains, but there's also uh, dis discrepancies. There's winners and losers. Um, on the one side, the ASEAN countries, on the other side, China, Japan, South Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. This has been shown in a shift in the textile industry and the production uh, sites. But also we can mention the, the automotive industry where there are uh, shifts uh, predicted uh, by CGE modeling. Um, so, um, and then the, the, the thing about the positive list and negative list uh, and the danger of negative lists that uh, they may not cover yet uh, things that come up, future technologies or, or fields of trade. Um, yeah, that's basically it. And for the questions, I would like to, to drop in one, two questions for all. And then I will put also in the questions from the audience. The first one is uh, referring to what also Kate said on, on the sectorial shifts and so on. Um, and I may ask all of you to, to respond if you wish. Uh, because now we see there's uh, winners and losers, um, but not only between nations, but also within nations, because if textile industry moves from one country to another, then you may have <laughs> a lot of unemployed textile workers in one country. So um, what is your answer to this? And the second would be more um, because now within, within the RCEP signatories, they are already, um, another 27 uh, PTAs and another 44 bilateral trade agreements. So there's this huge web of, of, of agreements interfering with each other or, or opposing each other maybe. Um, so what does it mean for, for, the, for global value chains or this, uh, this web of, of trade liberalization? And the question, the real question would be um, because in the last year, we saw the volatility of global value chains. Um, so is this really the way to go? Or shouldn't we focus more on resilient production capacity, capacities and economies? Um, I put these questions and I will also now read all the other questions and then I will give uh, 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 space for all speakers to respond. So there was a question from Jenny Simon, um, who would like to know more about the role technical standards have within RCP. And how far is the mutual recognition or even usage of specific technical standards part of the agreement? And are there mechanisms or agreement to further negotiate the agreement in later points in time to perhaps integrate more sectors? And then she, asks uh, to elaborate more on the conflicts during the negotiations. We already heard that India dropped out of the agreement. Um, and what were the subjects of conflict? Uh, and this will be probably also be covered in our next seminar when we to look more into the geopolitical uh, perspective. Jenny has a second question specifically for Professor Tran. Are there possibilities of governments to influence investment activities you mentioned, chapter 10, something special of the RCP 
uh, now I made the pronunciation mistake. I hope you understand the question. Are there possibilities of governments to influence investment activities you mention, or are similar options also part of the FTA? So I hope you can read the question because I'm a bit lost. Um, then there's an anonymous uh, person who asks about the financial service sector of India, if any one of you could uh, reply to this. And then there's Jenny again, um, who wants to know from Kate if the negative list approach refers only to, or she wants to know from all, only to services or other sectors too. So I will start with Kate. So we do in the, in the inverse order uh, of the presentations. I guess each one of you will have five minutes and then uh, everything should be covered. Go ahead, Kate. Okay. Um, well, yes, I was only talking about the references to the negative positive lists in the services chapter, but it really, there is no limit to what you can imagine is um, counted as services. I mean, everything can actually really be regarded as a service. Obviously, when it comes to tariffs, um, there's a, the goods chapters, there's a whole range of different uh, annexes that detail which goods are uh, referred to. So yeah, my, my reference to the which countries are on the negative and, and positive lists is relating to the services chapter. And that's um, because it's to do with liberalisation. It's about, you know, these, the, the, it's not to do with tariffs. It's around saying these industries will be those that we liberalise and where we treat uh, foreign investors as if they're domestic um, and that we won't provide, you know, and that we guarantee that this could mean, for example, your government says we have a new service um, uh, that, or we have funding for a service that would normally go to a, a public corporation. They need now to compete with private sector corporations who would be uh, bidding for that as if they were a public you know, sector corporation, if they're not restricted. You have to restrict it or, or you have to treat foreign investors as if they were the same as a state-owned enterprise. Um, uh, the, I mean, your broader question around, is this the way to go? I mean, that's the fundamental question. And I think really we need to think, we, need, we shouldn't be trying to amend these agreements. Uh, we need to really be thinking about um, what, what it is that we want economies to, to do. Who do they serve? Are, are we trying to design economies purely for growth of capital and profit or do we expect actually that economies are there to serve our own, our community, our prosperity, and including the prosperity, of course, of the planet? And that's where these fail. I mean, there's no, there's an inherent contradiction in the idea that we need agreements to, to um, foster growth of capital and the idea that we need better um, livelihoods for, for people and the redistribution. Obviously, um, with things like the sustainable development goals, which are completely you know, failing to be met in the region, basically because of the growth of inequality. And um, these tra trade agreements have always increased inequality. They may have increased the size of economies in some cases, although even that is debatable, but what they definitely have done in every country that um, has embraced them is increased the, the um, level of inequality in the country and um, that inevitably means a de decrease in democracy and that's something that's of huge deficit in our region. There's a large democratic deficit and that's not just about you know voting in governments, that's about who gets to have a say in how, how the economy is designed. So I would say that's um, fundamentally the problem. We need a, a better um, system. One positive, I guess, a small positive, is that there are now discussions around the world of other ways we can cooperate to address the problems that corporations are, um, have caused in the, as they've grown and become multinationals that are able to apply the set and apply their own rules. For example, I think this move to have a global minimum corporate tax rate is, an, is evidence that countries might be realising that we can't, are the rules that corporations have set are really harming our capacity to provide for 
public services because they're not paying taxes. You know, they're, they're designing themselves as multinationals to avoid national regulation. And um, that's so those kind of things are what we should be talking about. How do we set a minimum uh, decent corporate tax rate? We could do the same on wages. How do we set a minimum regional wage floor, which has been discussed before in ASEAN about having a, a, a wage floor, so that we're not looking at a race to the bottom, so that you know corporations can't jump from a country to country because they can see that one country's offering lower wages, another country's offering tax breaks, another country promises they won't apply environmental regulations if they come to their country. You know, we have to do away with this kind of harmful race to the bottom. And that's the kind of agreements I think we should be looking at is agreements that stop um, this, this, you know, really harmful competition rather than agreements that guarantee the continual uh, race to the bottom. I'll leave those. I'll leave my comments there. Thank you so much, Kate, for the comments. Um, there's another question now, but I uh, I don't want to 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 take too much time from the other speakers. Um, your I guess colleague Susanna Baria would like to know more about the UNCTAD study, but maybe you can just share the link to the study in the in the chat. Uh, there may be a executive summary or something where she can get the information she wants. And let's head over now to um, Professor Tran. Um, it's it's uh, up to you now. Can you hear me? Apparently, there's no. some... Ah, no. Uh, I was asking Professor Tran from, from Ho Chi Minh City to speak, but obviously she has some connections, connection problems. Can you hear me now? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah. so I, I see the questions from Jenny Simon. Uh, are the possibility of governments to influence investment activities you mentioned in chapter 10, something special to the RCP or RCP the options also part of other FTA? So thank you, Jenny, for uh, this uh, uh, wonderful this, um, possibility, possibilities and not something special of the RCEP. Uh, they also exist in uh, other uh, FTA, in particular new generation free trade agreements like CPTPP and EVFTA. So that's the reason why I uh, I say that uh, the RCEP represents a step backwards in comparison to CPTPP and EVFTA because in the this in these two agreements um, the governments even have more possibilities to influence investment in a, in order to protect uh, environmental and um, human rights um, interests. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Professor Tran, for for answering this question. I hand over now to Professor Sumei. Um, it's your time. Okay, fine. I, I will answer the standards question. Um, for standards, uh, take uh, technical regulations and conformity assessment procedures. That's in uh, Chapter Six of RCEP. And actually, RCEP aims uh, not only to improve implementation of the WTO agreement on TVT, uh, but also to promote mutual understanding between uh, the member states about each other's uh, standards, uh, technical regulations and conformity uh, assessment procedures and to improve uh, information exchange and cooperation in this field. So um, as we all know, um, in this chapter, um, there is a particular part about transparency and also um, the provisions are expected to uh, minimize the, um, the adverse effects of uh, regulations on trade by making information on exporting requirements easily available, reducing uh, transaction costs for businesses and uh, institutionalizing uh, mechanisms for our certain members to resolve specific trade issues uh, with the goal of reducing or eliminating unnecessary uh, TVT. So as the question answered, so 
Um, I think the role of the standards are being mentioned quite clearly in this chapter. And if we look at uh, the Article 6.6, uh, 6, it tells uh, in great detail. And then Article uh, 6.4 um, um, uh, specifies clearly the incorporation of the uh, TBT agreement of the WTO. And also the Article uh, 6.8 mentions about a neutral, uh, uh, about the mechanisms. Um, because time is limited, I won't go to details, but uh, for the mutual recognition, Article 6.9 mentions about cooperation and also the uh, existing mutual uh, recognition um, mechanisms. And for the last question, are there any arrangements for the future review or anything? Yes, uh, if we look at the Chapter 6.14 uh, dispute settlement, actually, the Chapter 19 dispute settlement shall not apply to uh, any matter arising under this chapter uh, at the entrance into force, uh, but um, um, the non-application will be subject to a review by the parties two years after the date of entry into force of RCEP. So this answers the last question. And I just want to add something, um, standards, technical regulation, and also uh, conformity assessments are very important. And if we compare the RCEPs um, the particular chapter, chapter six, so always the uh, we start up the your, your EU, and we'll find actually uh, standardization is uh, one of the key elements um, uh, which has witnessed the deepening process and the post its development and facilitate its progress of the European economic integration. As the European integration developed from uh, customs union after a short period of uh, stagnation and then to single market, and then to the economic and monetary union afterwards. Uh, as we all can see, the technical harmonization at the uh, European community level also actually moved from non-harmonization um, to the different approaches before uh, it reached the, the current uh, state. So uh, if we um, see, okay, uh, if we compare our set um, with the, um, is you will find European standardization has always uh, been in the same step as that of European integration. So if we um, want to study the interplay of the standardization with the economic uh, uh, integration, uh, EU is a very good example, but of course for our ship, comparatively speaking, um, is um, less is mentioned here, but uh, as already mentioned in the article uh, 6.14, uh, after two years of uh, entry into force of the RCEP, um, the details will be discussed. I think uh, as time is limited, I'll just uh, stop here. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Shumei. Um, so, yes, um, let's see. Um, the, the EU. Uh, may be a good example in a positive and in a negative way, because obviously there's also a lot of uh, discrepancies and, and problems within the economic uh, region. Um, the, the next seminar on the, that will be the 7th of, 8th of July, will focus more on the geopolitical side. So we will also look more into the questions uh, that has been raised, how does it relate to EU, also maybe EU-Vietnam free trade agreement, also the questions about conflicts of capital and, uh, and, 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 and world powers uh, in all these trade, worldwide trade regime. Um, so I leave it to that for now. I would like to thank again very much our three great speakers who gave us a lot of insight into this agreement and also uh, gave us some, 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 some hope, for example, that ISDS is still not set in the agreement and there's still space to keep it out. Um, I heard somewhere that there uh, has been a letter of intent of a group of five RCP members who don't want ISDS inside, so we will see where that goes. Um, Thank you again, three speakers, uh, Kate Lepin, Professor Tran, and Professor Shumai for your wonderful presentations. Also, thanks to the interpreters for the 
interpretation, which I didn't hear, but which must have been hard to have a German speaking with an English accent to be translated into German. And uh, also to all the other colleagues from Rosa Luxemburg Foundation who helped out with this. Uh, I don't know if Nadia Dorschner would like to say something at the end. We didn't speak about that. But if that's not the case, she says no in the chat. Um, see you all hopefully on 8th of July, July, same time, same channel. Have a nice day or evening, uh, dependent on where you are.